there's no way around the fact that the outcome of this game definitely sucks. But putting that aside for just a second, what an absolutely incredible night in Seattle, obviously from the historical standpoint where this was the first Stanley Cup playoff game in Seattle in 99 years. And actually back then it wasn't called the Stanley Cup playoffs, it was just playoff hockey where the eventual winner got the Stanley Cup. That being in the last year of the PCHA, where the Seattle Metropolitans ended up losing in two games by total goals to the Vancouver Maroons, who would end up losing to the eventual Stanley Cup winner in two games, that being the Montreal Canadiens of the NHL. And of course, obviously, this also being the first ever home playoff game of the Seattle Kraken, Seattle's first NHL team. And again, an absolutely amazing atmosphere from the beginning of the night around the arena to pretty much all night long inside of it. A truly unbelievable experience in pretty much every aspect for myself and I'm sure anybody else who was lucky enough to be there or around that area during this game. And honestly, even with the unfortunate eventual outcome of the game, still one of the absolute best events of any kind that I've ever been to and certainly a night that I'll never forget. What's cracking, everybody, and welcome back to Kraken r, r where, unfortunately, in the historic first-ever home playoff game of the Seattle Kraken, they do end up losing 6-2 to, to the Colorado Avalanche, who now take the 2-1 series lead. But even in spite of that, again, I just have to emphasize what an absolutely unreal environment there was inside of that building tonight, where, again, I don't think there's anybody that was in there that's going to forget it anytime soon, and certainly a game that... Well, pretty much all that was missing was for the Kraken to win it. And I don't know how much of that translated to the TV product, but I'm sure a fair amount of it did, and I'd love to hear down in the comment section from those of you that did watch it on TV how much of that did come through, or from those of you that were lucky enough to be in the arena as well, what your experience was, and I mean, I can't imagine you would disagree with me with just how that atmosphere felt in that building. Easily the loudest I've ever heard that building over the course of this game, and we'll get into that specifically in one point. But unfortunately, the Avalanche did have to go and, well, I wouldn't really say ruin it, as it still was a pretty great night, all things considered. But they certainly put a damper on, again, what was otherwise a pretty perfect night. And I suppose we probably should actually get to that game where, lineup-wise, there were actually changes for both teams as the Kraken are missing Morgan Geeky, with Tanev then jumping up to Geeky's spot on the wing of the second line, and Froden jumping into the fourth line. Meanwhile, for the Avalanche... They were missing Nachushkin, which is certainly a big hit for them. One of their biggest keys through the cup run they had last year, and he also had a pretty good game in game two. Even with those changes, though, for the third game in a row, it's the Kraken who get off to the fast start. The Avalanche do, I think they might have gotten the first shot on goal, but they do get an early shot on goal, which is more than can be said for their efforts in the start of both of the first two games. But it's still Seattle who gets the better of the momentum and actually gets an early power play, though... That really didn't have much to do with the momentum, as it really doesn't go much of anywhere. Again, this Colorado penalty kill, very aggressive and making it hard for the Kraken to even get set up in the offensive end. And especially with the Kraken power play, liking to kind of just pass it around the outside and especially get it to McCann so he can drive up towards the net for that shot. The Avalanche are not giving McCann or really any of the Kraken outside players any kind of space to do what they usually like to do on the power play. Anyway... Out of that power play, the Kraken do actually start to get pressure back at 5-on-5 five five because for whatever reason, the Kraken, and we've seen this all season, seem to be better at 5-on-5 five five than they are on the power play. At 5-on-5, five five, they get that momentum going, nearly score as the second line gets out there and gets the puck up to the net and creates some chaos around it, but just can't find that bounce to, I think it was Schwartz's stick next to the net to actually just tap it in at that point. It gets past them out behind the net. Still, they're able to rim it around, keep the offensive end as Schultz has it up by the blue line. He skates towards the middle and fires off a shot. It's tipped and it's in! The Kraken are on the board first and the first home playoff goal is a tip in by Jaden Schwartz on a Justin Schultz shot. And I got that right, although I was pretty sure I was going to screw it up because Justin Schultz to Jaden Schwartz is not something you can say fast very many times in a row. And oh man, was that building rocking. Easily, to that point anyway, the loudest Let's Go Kraken I can ever remember hearing. And there's been some loud ones. Certainly a couple of overtime winners and upsets that the Kraken had in their first season. There weren't a ton of them, but a couple that they had there. 
Still, this was unlike any other, and most importantly, the Kraken with, again, another fast start, and proving that even if they did let up those three unanswered goals to give up the comeback to the Avalanche in Game 2, they weren't just going to roll over in the rest of the series. The Kraken tried to add on to it over the next couple of minutes, but eventually as we get more towards the middle of the period, things do start to shift towards the Avs, and although they aren't able to score because Grubauer once again is coming up huge in net, they do eventually get a power play. And although the Kraken penalty kill has been fantastic through games one and two, it just feels like this avalanche power play is due to break through, again with them being one of the, well, they finished sixth in the NHL over the course of the regular season. Still, they are unable to find the back of the net once again, thanks to Grubauer and a opportunistic kill from the Kraken. But of course, on the other end of that, the Kraken themselves haven't, to this point, found the back of the net on power play and they're going to go to one right after this kill comes to an end. Which, at the very least, you would think kills off another two minutes of this first period, and you're going to get to that first intermission with the Kraken holding that one to nothing lead. But no, right away on this Kraken power play, the Avalanche, with that aggressive killing style, are able to force the puck out of the offensive end, and then they've got a two-on-two -two rush that they're really just kind of trying to get it into the offensive end so they can get a change and kill off some time holding the puck. But as they're pressing the Kraken through the neutral zone, Sprong blows a tire, falls on his butt, and that turns it into two-on-one, which then really amps up the speed that they're attacking with. And the pass from Makar pretty much sets Comfer loose on at least a partial break, as he's able to get around the last remaining Kraken defender, get around Grubauer, and put it in just past his toe, and just past the post into the net to tie the game at one. And so now at this point, you have both power plays yet to score in the series, and both have given up a shorthanded goal over the course of it, with the Kraken scoring the shorthanded goal in game two. Still, not ideal, but you've got a lot of power play left. Maybe you can make something happen and get that lead back going into the first, but the Kraken aren't able to make that happen, and then the Avalanche get a power play not long after with less than a minute left at this point. At least the good news here is Tanev draws a call going back the other way that sends it to four on four. And of course, like we said a number of times towards the end of the season, again, for whatever reason, although the Kraken are great at five on five and during the regular season, we're actually pretty good at three on three in overtime, four on four continues to be a nightmare adventure that just never seems to go the Kraken way. And sure enough, about halfway through it with less than a minute left in this first period, Dunn makes an ill-advised decision to try to pinch up in the high slot to try and keep the puck in the offensive end. His stick doesn't get to it before Nathan McKinnon's does, so McKinnon chips it past Dunn, and then it's a foot race between McKinnon and Larson, which, no offense to Larson, I think we all know who's going to win that foot race. And sure enough, McKinnon, in on the breakaway, beats Grubauer glove side to give the Avs the 2-1 to one lead, and just like that, a couple of Bad mistakes lead to breakaways, and the Avalanche capitalize on both to take the lead going into the end of the first. So to say the least then, definitely not an ideal end of this first period, but I suppose even though the Avalanche now have two goals, at least neither one of them came off of a defensive zone lost faceoff for the Kraken. That happens just a couple minutes into the second period, where the Avalanche should take them a little bit of time to get going, but eventually they do. They get some offensive zone pressure, Grubauer makes a couple of saves, and those saves lead to those faceoffs in the Kraken end of the ice. And a few minutes in, it's one of those faceoffs that's won cleanly back for Kale McCarr. He winds up and fires off the one time shot that goes right into the far side top corner to give the Avs the 3 to 1 lead. It is Beneers who ends up losing this faceoff that leads immediately to the Kale McCarr goal. And that has kind of been a weak point for him over the course of this whole rookie season. But that is somewhat to be expected from a young player, and it really shouldn't matter when it comes to who's losing these faceoffs, as he's not the only one that's been losing these faceoffs in the Kraken end. That's been a solid team effort there so far, these playoffs. And even regardless of who's losing them, you should be able to at least plan for that and not constantly allow these shots on goal or good scoring chances right off of it. I mean, we saw actually a couple times this game, both Wemberg and Yanni Gord kind of go with a what the heck, I'm probably going to lose this face-off anyway. Actually, those two being a couple of the better face-off winners for the Kraken. But both of them kind of went with the strategy of let the guy win it and just get past him to get to the puck first. Which, 
If you do that in this case, it prevents Makar from taking this shot. Obviously not a strategy you'd like to have to rely on, but that seems to be where we're at at this point. Anyway, the Kraken do try to respond to this now 3-1 to lead for the Avs, but they don't score on it, and then the Avalanche press right back, killing that off before it can turn into much momentum, and then they end up with another power play, which... Again, the more you test a power play as good as the Avalanche have, no matter how good the Kraken kill has been, eventually it's got to cost you. So this starts to feel like a game that could get out of hand pretty quick. And although the Kraken did win game one, three to one, that still wasn't really a game that necessarily got fully out of hand in the Kraken favor. But with things going the way they are in this game at this point, it kind of feels like that might be coming, especially if the Avalanche score on this power play. And honestly, at this point, it was... I wouldn't say dead, but it was pretty quiet and the crowd had been taken mostly out of this game, even with all of the energy that they had for that first ever playoff game. Well, home playoff game, you know what I mean. At the very least though, fortunately for the Kraken, their penalty kill remains hot as it kills off yet another Avalanche power play and does a pretty good job of it, only allowing I think one shot attempt and I don't even know if that turned into a shot on goal. Either way, a great kill for the Kraken. The Avs though are starting to press once again right out of the power play. The Kraken survive that and press right back, getting a rush chance towards the other end. Gord gets a crossing pass to Alexiak, which doesn't seem like the most dangerous setup for a, an offensive attack, but Alexiak makes Rantanen look like a fool, just jukes the jockstrap out of him to get into the slot, and then backhand roofs it into the net to bring the Kraken to within one, and who knew that the big rig could handle like a sports car. And just like that, the Kraken are back in it, and with them comes the crowd. But the best is yet to come, as I don't even think most people in the arena had a chance to sit down after the Alexiak goal, when the Kraken are right back into the offensive end, Beneers and Eberle feed the puck down behind the net, where McCann gets to it, and as the PA announcer is starting to announce the Alexiak goal, he can only get out the words, Seattle Kraken goal! And then as if he's speaking it into existence, McCann gets it up in front, Beneers skate to stick and roasts it into the back of the net 19 seconds later and the game is tied just like that. And who better than Matty Beneers to be the one that ties this game with that quick turnaround. We've got a brand new game all of a sudden and this is the point where this arena hit its absolute peak in volume to the point where I think there's a fair amount of people whose ears were probably ringing. And honestly, this is probably top three in loudest sporting events I've ever been to at this point. I mean, it's right up there with the Seahawks Saints playoff game that at the time set the record, like Guinness world record for loudest outdoor sporting event that would eventually get broken by Kansas City and then rebroken by Seattle. But up there with that one, and also, and actually weirdly enough, I think this one might have been louder than that world record setting one, even though it came before it, there just wasn't a decibel meter there to actually measure it. But the Hail Mary in the third game that Russell Wilson played that became known other places as the Fail Mary, but I'm sticking with Hail Mary, that ended up winning that game against the Packers in the final seconds on the last play. Both of those were deafeningly loud and definitely had my ears ringing even leaving the stadium, but this one was almost up there with those. But even if this wasn't quite as loud as those two, it's definitely up there near them even with all those acoustic panels that carpet the top of Climate Pledge Arena. And yes, I know there's been louder ones in Seattle's history, like the Beast Quake or either of the last two NFC championships, and I'm sure Edgar's double in 95 the way that that kingdom could hold and amplify noise. Plus, there's also Cal Raleigh's home run from last year, but I wasn't at any of those. So as far as events that I've been at, again, this is easily one of the loudest. And it wasn't just that loud when this goal went in, although there was a pretty noticeable spike from what was already a pretty noisy arena after the Alexiak goal just seconds before this one, but it stayed that loud for quite a while through them announcing Alexiak's goal and then another pretty big spike when they announced Matty Beneers as the scorer of the second one. And honestly, although it did die down some over the next couple of minutes, really through the last few minutes of the second period, there was a pretty healthy roar just kind of ambiently in the arena up until intermission finally came where there was a crack in power play in there as well that amped things up a little bit but again the power play really didn't go much of anywhere so that kind of just was all for nothing and we get to the intermission going into the third tied at three but then the third period happens and it starts happening pretty early on 
as apparently what was once the Kraken thing in this series, scoring in the first five minutes of the first four periods of the series, and then almost doing that again in the first period of this game. The Avalanche make it the second period in a row for them, scoring in the first five minutes. Three minutes into the third, the Avalanche get a three-on-two rush into the Kraken end. And, <laughs> I mean... Honestly, I can't think of a single reason or thought in the world that Alexiak and Borgen could have possibly had as to what was going on here defensively between the two of them. The Avalanche come into the Kraken end three wide, and with the options of Devon Taves, who has the puck on one side, Nieto in the middle, or Miko Rantanen on the far side, both Alexiak and Borgen decide to converge on Nieto in the middle, and you'd think between those three options with Devon Taves and Miko Rantanen being two of the best players the Avalanche have to offer and Nieto only playing because Nachushkin's out, they might want to defend Taves and Rantanen. Now, realistically, the best thing to do here is to defend Nieto and Rantanen and leave Grubauer to defend a shot if Taves decides to take it. But no, they decide to go for the worst possible option, both converging on Nieto and sure enough, Taves pulls up, finds Rantanen on the far side, completely forgotten about, and he puts the shot into the net to give the Avs the 4-3 lead. Okay, so that's certainly not ideal, but there's still plenty of third period left to tie this game and get to overtime or, heck, even maybe win it in regulation. After all, they scored two goals in 19 seconds in the second period, so there's no reason they couldn't do it to win it here in the third. But then, like a minute and 30 seconds later or something, the Avalanche pressing for more as they continue to have momentum after scoring the first time. This time it's just the Nathan McKinnon show, and while you could nitpick this play from all sorts of different perspectives, I mean it all starts with Donato getting his ankles completely broken by McKinnon who gets around Donato at the faceoff circle, and then Don definitely could have come up a little bit farther to challenge McKinnon's shot, instead he gives McKinnon way too much space to take this shot, and Grubauer does leave probably a little bit too much space on that near side between he and the post and certainly leaves the corner open. But in the end, it's just a great play to get around Donato and then an absolutely perfect shot into the one spot that Grubauer left from one of the best players in the NHL. I mean, I would argue that he's one of the top three players in the NHL. Either way, definitely a guy who is going to have goals like this over a course of a series. And although we didn't see it in game one or two, he's now got two here in game three. And at that point, it does make it five to three. And yeah, while it's still possible, it does kind of feel like this one's pretty much over. There was still, I mean, the energy wasn't completely gone from the building, but you could tell there was a lot of air that had been let out of it. And sure enough, the Avalanche do kind of go into defense first mode the rest of the way. The Kraken eventually get Grubauer pulled with three minutes and 30 seconds. Eventually, Rantanen finds the back of the empty net, so that makes it 6-3. to three. The Kraken get a late power play as McKinnon just got frustrated by something in the final minute of the game and had a bad cross-check that gave the Kraken that power play. And of course, on this power play with like a minute and 30 seconds left in the game, not even a full power play that the Kraken are going to get here with a three-goal deficit, so it's pretty much garbage time at this point. It's this one, even with the four in this game earlier that you could have scored on to make a difference when it mattered, or all the other ones earlier on in this series. It's this one that the Kraken win the faceoff immediately up to Schultz. Schultz fires off the shot, and just like the first goal, it's tipped in by Schwartz. Schultz to Schwartz for the second time, bookending the game, but it's not enough in the end. The Kraken end up losing this, even with that first ever franchise playoff power play goal. They lose 6-4. I guess if anything, maybe they can take that success on the power play, the first power play goal for either team in this series, and carry that over into the rest of the games as they definitely need to get this next one at home and then split the two at home going back to Colorado with that series tied. As for the big takeaways from this game, again, the first one has to be just the historic nature of this game and the incredible atmosphere surrounding it in the arena, outside the arena. Seattle just obviously showing that it's been way, way too long that we haven't had playoff hockey with the potential of the Stanley Cup at the end of it. So even though the outcome isn't what we wanted, definitely showed that this is one of the most incredible atmospheres in the entire NHL. And there's only going to be more of that in the days and years to come. As for what happened on the ice more specifically, I know there's going to be some questions about whether or not you change up goaltending with Grubauer having let in five in this game. 
Honestly, I thought Grubauer played pretty well. Not Certainly not as well as he played in Game 1 or even Game 2. But as far as his appearances over the course of just this season are concerned, even taking last season out of the question, this was definitely an above-average Grubauer performance, even if the stats aren't going to show anything close to that. And besides, again, when you look at the goals that he let in, the first two come on breakaways, one of which is one of the best players in the world that has it, and an ex-teammate who certainly had some of those looks in practice and knew where to put that puck. Then you have yet another one scored off of a lost face-off in the defensive end, which even outside of the fact that the goal is scored by probably the best defender in the NHL at this point, this is just its whole other issue. And if you continue to lose face-offs in your end of the ice as consistently as the Kraken are doing in this series, then it doesn't matter who's in net. Some of those are going to end up in the net past that goaltender. Then you got the three on two. That's almost like a two on O with two of the best players on the avalanche and the two Kraken players going for probably the least threatening person they had in their lineup. And finally, another Nathan McKinnon one where you just have to tip your hat to him. Sure, Grubauer left him a little window, but he put it perfectly in that window because he's as good as he is. Plus, I suppose to top it all off, you also have the issue contributing to all this that this is a Kraken team who, again, allowed the second fewest shots on goal per game over the course of the regular season and is now allowing the most shots on goal per game in this postseason, another 34 on net in this game. So that just continues to be one of the weirdest negative turnarounds from this Kraken regular season to postseason that, I mean, again, we'd like to see them turn it around, but it's starting to look like that might not be what's going to happen and you're just going to need your goaltender to keep you in these games. Anyway, with that, we'll finish off with the Kraken three stars where I think the first two are going to be pretty obvious. It's the Schwartz-Schultz combination. Schwartz first with the two goals, Schultz second with the two assists. And honestly, even outside of that, the two of them were two of the best Kraken players on the ice, even if you take away the points that they score. The third Kraken star, also probably not a big surprise. I'm going with Matty Beneers. Easily his best game of the series so far. And that's not to say that he played poorly in either of the first two. Just wasn't the impact player that you need your first line center to be. Obviously, we're not expecting him to be Connor McDavid or Nathan McKinnon just yet. But that first line had been held quiet in the first two games. And finally, the three of them combined for that game tying goal to make it 3-3. Three three. Benier's the one that finishes it. So good to see them finally getting on the board. And like the power play at the end of the game for the Kraken, hopefully that's just the damn breaking for them and they can really get things rolling here in the remainder of the games in this series and well, hopefully the rest of the playoffs moving on from there anyway with that again i'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below especially if you were at the game what you thought of the atmosphere around the arena leading up to the game or even if you stayed outside the arena during it i know they had the beer garden and watch area outside the arena for people to watch even if they weren't able to get in the arena or what your experience was watching it at home, the first playoff home game in Seattle history as a part of the NHL. Again, there's the playoff games that were way back in the start of the last century. Anyway, love to know your thoughts of this game and everything surrounding it. Otherwise, until next time, in game four, game two at home, if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy this video, their buttons for that kind of stuff down below. Help support the channel. So I'd appreciate you using them. And until next time, stay safe out there. Be good to each other. God bless and go Kraken.